In our force of a spring lab, this was the conclusion that we reached. When we looked at the relationship between the force exerted by a spring and the amount of stretch that it had, we found out that as we increase the amount of stretch, it increased the amount of force required to do that stretching. Uh, when we all looked at different springs, uh, some of our springs found out that the amount of force needed for a given amount of stretch was higher, let's say for the green spring, than it was for the red spring. They all had linear relationships between the amount of force and the amount of stretch, and we said that the slope was related to the strength of the spring or the spring constant. For a green spring, our slope or our spring constant was 50 newtons per meter, required about 50 newtons of force to stretch at one meter, and for a red spring, we said it was a weaker spring because it only required about 25 newtons of force to stretch at a meter. Our generalization of the results for our force of a spring lab was that the force uh, that a spring exerts, either pulls with or pushes with, is equal to this, its spring constant, the value in newtons per meter, times the amount of stretch, and this was known as Hooke's Law. In this video, uh, I want to talk about not the force required to stretch a spring, but uh, the effort required to stretch a spring, or we'll say the energy we need to use to stretch a spring. And when we either stretch a spring or compress a spring, the energy that we use gets stored in that spring or that elastic material. Uh, these are just two examples of storing effort or energy in a spring, which can be used later. Uh, this first example is of an air rifle. That barrel, which is normally straight, a straight out here, kind of gets pushed down and it compresses a spring inside of that stock and that's used to shoot like a pellet or a BB. Uh, that stored effort or that stored energy then goes to accelerating and uh, shooting that BB. In this case of an amusement park ride, there's long bungee cables that get stretched. There's a four-wheeler or an ATV that ends up stretching those things out, so there's effort involved. And that effort is stored in there, and as soon as they release the cable, that stored effort or energy launches someone back and forth. And we'll watch a little video of that in just a second. Now, we can store energy not just in springs by compressing them, or in this case, stretching them. We can store uh, what we're going to call elastic energy, or the potential energy of a spring, in just any material that's elastic, where if you compress it, it wants to push back, or if you stretch it, it wants to pull back. Uh, one is in human prosthetics, and another one is in crossbows. Let's look at a few of these videos a little bit closer. In the case of the, the amusement ride, this thing's called a human bungee slingshot. They basically take a four-wheeler or something to, to uh, pull back or stretch those bungee, bungee cords. So there's definitely a lot of effort involved in stretching those bungees. Uh, those stretch bungees have elastic potential energy stored in them, and once they're released, that energy or stored effort is used to fling somebody back and forth. Check it out. This is a picture of a crossbow from above. This bow uh, attached to the string right here was the string was pulled back uh, and an arrow was fitted in the slot and when the string was pulled back this bow flexed when it flexed it's a lot of effort was involved to do so and that effort is stored within that flexed bow here's a slow motion video uh, of it unflexing basically releasing that stored effort to shoot an arrow incredibly fast you can see that this this elastic material is now going back to its original relaxed condition, releasing that stored effort. Our last example of an elastic material storing energy within it and then releasing it is one involving human prosthetics. So human prosthetics have come to the point where uh, amputees or even w double amputees above the knee uh, can not only run but sprint with these type of prosthetics and the material right here I believe is made out of uh, metal I'm not quite sure what material it is um, but you can see kind of in slow motion that as they run and this material collides with the ground right there you can see that it's flexed 
and in its flex state there's some effort involved as they kind of come down against the ground to flex that elastic material it stores that effort it took to flex it uh, and as they move past it this material unflexes and releases that effort or releases that energy and basically allows them to uh, quite easily run not lose that effort in the collision kind of gets stored and then released and springs back I'd now like to talk about how we can store that effort used to stretch a spring or compress a spring or a, a flex an elastic material uh, the amount of energy that's required to do so which is stored I would like to quantify that so let's just think about let's think about a simple situation just one of our uh, red or our green springs stretching it from its relaxed state let's say call this a position of zero and what things determine how much effort is involved to stretch that spring consequently the amount of effort or energy stored in that spring well one is obviously how far this the spring is stretched If you stretch it farther it's going to require more effort and it will store more of that effort so the energy required to stretch a spring involves the combination of number one the displacement or stretch of that spring if you think back to our red and our green spring our red spring was our weakest spring that we tested the green one was the strongest one uh, it would require different amounts of force uh, to stretch each of these things the same amount and so it do not only depends on the amount of stretch of the spring it also depends on the force you use to stretch that spring if you need more force to stretch it and you stretch it farther both of those things will increase the amount of effort involved and therefore the amount of energy stored so if we want to represent this quantitatively uh, we need to somehow represent the combination of this force and stretch together so it kind of leaves us to the question well how do we represent the combination of any two values in general I'd like to go back and talk about how we found displacement of a moving object because that also involved the combination of two different things uh, if you're moving your displacement depends on two things number one how fast you're traveling and how much time you're traveling at that speed if you're moving faster you're gonna go farther if you're moving uh, at the same speed and you're traveling for a longer amount of time you'll also go farther so your displacement depends on both so let's go back and think about how did we represent displacement let's think about it graphically um, under constant velocity if something was moving at a, t a, vo a constant velocity of two meters per second say for a total of six seconds we found this graphically by finding the area under the line specifically in a velocity versus time graph so if we shade in that area right there remember that the displacement is in this case the area of a, tr of a rectangle so we have height times width our height is two meters per second our width of our rectangle is six seconds so the displacement is 12 meters see that the second units cancel well this worked not only when our velocity was constant we could also use that same technique to find out the displacement of an object that's accelerating let's say something moves from a initial velocity of zero meters per second to a final velocity of three meters per second over a total of six seconds we can also find that displacement by finding the area under this line in this case it's a triangle and not a rectangle we have one half times the base of our triangle times the height and that gives us a displacement of nine meters so remember we were trying to find a way to quantitatively represent the combination of two values in the case of displacement it depended on how fast you're traveling the velocity and how much time you're traveling that speed or time so if we graph one variable versus the other variable or velocity versus time the area underneath the line or whatever get that gets plotted happens to be the combination of both of those things both velocity and time let's now use this idea to quantitatively determine the amount of energy stored in a spring remember we said the amount of effort involved or the effort or energy stored is related to two things both the force used or the force exerted by the spring uh, over some displacement 
and that the energy or effort depended on both. And so if we want to represent quantitatively the combination of the force used over some amount of stretch, we're going to graph force versus stretch and the area under whatever is plotted represents the combination of both of those values. So let's do this one for our red spring and two for the green spring. If you remember our red spring when we graphed force versus stretch uh, it had a slope of about 25 newtons per meter that means it takes about 25 newtons of force in the end to stretch it to a total distance of one meter. To stretch it to half a meter it only takes half of that or about 12.5 newtons. So the energy to stretch the spring which is also equal to the energy stored in the spring is equal to the area under a force versus stretch graph. If we shade in that area since this is a linear positive linear relationship we have the area of a triangle so the energy stored is equal to the area of a triangle which is one half base times height and we'll call this uh, elastic energy or the energy stored in an elastic material it's equal to one half times the base well the base is one meter times the height which is a uh, force of 25 newtons and you get 12.5 newton meters or newton times meters so we'd say that the elastic energy is equal to 12 and a half newton meters or joules uh, in physics we use the joule to represent the combination of a newton times a meter uh, and this is our metric measure of energy let's now do the same thing for the green spring uh, that green spring, remember, it was stronger or stiffer. It required more force per meter to stretch it. And so we'd imagine if we stretch the green spring one meter, it's going to store more effort or more energy. We can see that by the triangle now shaded under that green line on a force versus stretch graph. And if we calculate or quantify that energy, again, this is the area of a triangle, one half base times height. Uh, we get one half times the base of one meter times the height, in this case, is 50 newtons we see that the amount of effort or energy stored is 25 newton meters or 25 joules. Let's look at the green spring a little bit closer. We just just calculated that it stores 25 newton meters or 25 joules of energy. Requires that much to stretch it a meter and it stores that amount of effort. Let's look at what happens uh, over the first half meter of that stretch and then over the second half meter of that stretch. So if we stretch the spring from its relaxed state an additional half of a meter or 50 centimeters and this is the general force versus stretch graph for how force is related to stretch for the green spring for the first half meter of stretch we've got the air the energy stored uh, is represented by the area it's 6.25 newton meters or six and a quarter joules if we then go from that half a meter stretch to the remaining full meter of stretch, so an additional half a meter, we're stretching it, stretching it from a half meter to one meter, the energy stored or the effort required to stretch at the last half meter is an additional 6.25 and 12.5 newton meters or joules. That's the total area under the last half of that force versus stretch graph. That's a combination of 18.75 joules. So we can see that the first half meter, it stores six and a quarter joules of energy. For the last half meter, that spring stores three times that amount of energy for a total of 25 joules. Now think about why would that make sense that the first half meter, there's only six and a quarter joules stored, where the last half meter stretch, there's 18.75 joules of energy. It's because the spring at a half meter to one meter requires a much larger force the entire half meter of stretch. Remember the energy stored is related to the force used over some displacement. Since the force is larger over that half meter of displacement there will be a larger amount of energy stored. Now that we've learned how to quantify the effort or energy stored in a compressed or stretched material, specifically a spring, graphically, let's see if we can also determine an algebra algebraic way of determining that. So let's go back to our graphical way of determining that. Uh, if we have just in general a generic spring that has some linear relationship between force and stretch, we said the slope is the k constant or the spring constant. 
the area under that graph, or in that, this case the line, is the energy stored, which is the area of a triangle. So let's just say it's from its relaxed position to some uh, amount of stretch, and to get to that amount of stretch, remember we calculate that by taking the spring constant times the stretch. This was Hooke's law. So the area under this line is the area of a triangle, which is one half base times height, and that's equal to the amount of elastic energy or effort stored in that spring. So we have one half times the base. Well, the base is just uh, in variable form the amount of stretch, and the height of our triangle is the amount of force needed to stretch it to some amount of stretch. So just k times stretch. Well, like you see on the graph, th that force can be calculated by multiplying k times the stretch. So let's substitute in in place of Fs, or the force exerted by the spring, let's substitute k times the stretch, or the spring constant times the stretch. So we get 1 half times the stretch times the spring constant times the stretch again. That can be simplified to 1 half k delta x squared, or 1 half times the spring constant times the stretch squared. <coughs> so if you're stretching a spring, compressing it or stretching a spring from, from its relaxed position, the amount of energy or effort stored in that spring will be equal to one half times k times the stretch squared. Looks like this. Uh, remember, EEL stands for elastic energy stored in the spring. K stands for the spring constant, the strength of the spring as measured in newtons per meter. And delta x represents the amount of displacement or stretch of that spring, whether it's the compression or the amount of stretch. If we look at the units, if we're solving for an energy, remember we should get newton meters, or which is also a joule. So we have one half times k. Remember k has units of newtons per meter. We're multiplying that by the stretch squared. The stretch in metric units would be meters. Uh, so stretch squared would be meters squared. So we get a newton per meter times meters squared. Uh, one, the m in the bottom cancels out, and one of the m's up top does, so we're left over with newton times meters. And remember, a newton meter is a joule. So multiplying a spring constant times a displacement squared or an amount of stretch squared would give us some quantity of energy. Now if you're taking AP Physics 1, the equation on your AP Physics sheet looks just a little bit different, and this is what it looks like. Um, they have 1 half kx squared, uh, but they have this us. Now, whenever you see a capital U in your AP equation sheet, that stands for some type of potential energy, some stored amount of energy just waiting to be used. Well, this is the potential energy stored inside of spring or an elastic material, so they label it U sub S. We'll call that the spring potential energy. So the amount of potential energy stored in a spring is equal to 1 half times K, the spring constant, times X, which they just use x to represent displacement or stretch.